Good afternoon. We'll be in Romans chapter 8, finishing up that chapter beginning in verse 31. Romans 8, 31. Today's the 21st of April, 2020. There won't be too many more nights and days for work together again in church and uh, certainly be glad to see you there. Looking at some of the numbers this afternoon about the views and uh, some good news. Uh, people are turning the, the uh, resource to, uh, button on on our website and uh, so we'll be grateful for that. So, if you will, Romans 8, verse 31, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, that there is now no more condemnation for those who love you, Lord. Thank you for that provision that was found in Christ Jesus, your Son. Thank you, Lord, for all it meant for you to do that for us, Lord, the sacrificing of your Son, Lord, and watching him suffer on the cross for us. Lord, I ask you would forgive me my sins, Lord, and where I so easily stumble and bumble and fail you, Lord. Lord, I realize that I am human and I make mistakes, Lord, but I realize that you love me have given me your spirit, Lord, so that I may please you more and more. May this please you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we say to these things? What things? All the things that we've talked about before. Uh, the spirit making intercession for us. God foreknowing us. God predestining. God conforming us to the image of his Son. Uh, justifying us and one day glorifying. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Right? There is no condemnation because we share the righteousness of God and the law cannot condemn us. There is no obligation to sin because the Spirit of God is inside of us and enables us to overcome the flesh. We come and there is no frustration because one day we will share the glory of God. Think about that. Our plans, our schemes are, are sometimes thwarted, our opportunities are sometimes passed over, but there's really no ultimate frustration for the Christian. We will share in the glory of God, right? Verse 30, more of whom he predestinated, these he also called, whom he called, these also justified, whom he justified, these he will also glorify. We will share, there's no frustration, no condemnation, no obligation, no frustration. Uh, because uh, of the blessed hope of Christ's return. And in these final few verses here, Paul does uh, at least five things for us. He uh, helps us to understand how that works out. And uh, the very first part of that, again, is that God is for us. We may think that uh, things don't always work out for us. Uh, there was a uh, Jacob, who in uh, Genesis 42, 36 said, all these things were against us, but we actually, everything is working for us. The conclusion is obvious. If God is for us, who's against us? He's promised us certain things. Right? We, we as believers should enter into each new day, believing that God has planned that day out and nothing has caught God by surprise. Nothing in that day that we meet uh, will, is meant to uh, condemn us. Nothing that we meet in that day is, is meant to uh, make us fall or make us stumble of things that we are, are meeting that day. Uh, we all know that God is, has set up that we must go through trials so that we must mature, right? We experience the pressure that these crises and these tribulations bring on us, cause us to grow. And if we run into those things in a day's time with each new day, and each day has its own problems and its own things, at the end of the day, we know that God has been for us all day long. The world says, no, God's not for them. Sometimes our heart betrays us and says, but God's not for us. Sometimes our mind says, I'm looking around, God's not for us. But the ultimate truth on the other side of eternity is that God has always been for us. Verse 32, Christ died for us. 
he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall we how shall he not with him also freely give us all things arguing from the greatest to the least if god didn't spare his son for if he gave us the greatest possession of heaven why wouldn't he take care of us now if he loved us when we were yet sinners why wouldn't he love us now that we are his children all of these things, God freely gives those things. God gives us his best. Uh, Jesus used the same argument over in Matthew chapter 6 when he says that God uh, provides for the birds, right? There he is. Uh, why do we care about these things? God provides for the sparrow. There's none that fall to the ground and doesn't know about. There's none that he doesn't feed. If God cares about the least of these things, why wouldn't he care about us? Christ died for us to bring us so that he could give these things to us freely. There's nothing stingy, nothing going to be held back from us. The very fact that he gave us all of eternity in his son should prove to us that he would not hold out anything to us, right? That that would cause us to be more justified and cause us to, to miss glory. These are things that Christ did for us. Not only that, verse, thir uh, verse 33 says, whom shall bring a charge against God's elect? Well, no one, right? Satan is the adversary, the old accuser, right? That's what he was doing there with, with, uh, with Job, there in the book of Job. You know, they're meeting there in heaven, and God says, uh, have you considered my servant Job? And uh, the accuser says, you know what? I would do you really well. I would do really well for me. You give him all these houses. You give him all the children. You protect him uh, in and out. Why wouldn't he praise you? Why wouldn't he do that? Accusing Job of being less than grateful to God because he had been blessed by God. He says, you take any of these things away and he'll curse you. That's what he does. He's always been an ancient lawyer. All the way back from the very beginning, there on the tree. Always been there. Always been trying to impugn the Father. Always been in there trying to kill the Son before He could come. Always been in there trying to maliciously attack us, right? That's how He works. Who would bring charges against us, right? Um, it would be Satan. But what power did He have? Well, He has none because of the, the blood of Christ. He has none because it is God who justifies us, right? That's his end. God has uh, been elected and we've been chosen in Christ and we've been accepted in Christ. We're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. When God looks at me, he looks at Christ and, and, and in a positional sense, now, in a progressive sense, I'm not there. But again, the whole idea is that I will not get to leave here until I look more like his son, practically, right? Positionally, I, I do, but practically, I don't. His idea is that he'll make me practically look like him. That's what he's promised to do. And uh, God certainly isn't going to accuse us since he's going to be the one that justifies us. The, the courtroom is stacked. Satan has nothing to bring there. He goes and looks at the books and begins to bring back that old charge of sin, that old habit of sin, that old thing of sin. The slate's been washed clean. The blood of Christ has washed it. So when he begins to present his evidence in that heavenly court, there is none. The judge, the father, looks there and says, I don't see anything. Look over there at Christ who is, who is defending us and says, I don't see any. I, I think those things have been paid for and washed off the, the book. Matter of fact, at the end of time, Satan's going to be bound in hell. So they, he won't even be there to accuse us. So anyway, that's how he works. And uh, So we see that God is for us. Christ has died for us. God has justified us. And uh, to understand the meaning of justification is to bring peace to our hearts, right? If we're righteous with God, if we can go to bed knowing that we please God every night, if we can go to bed knowing that we have done what God's asked us to do, there's a great peace in the heart, right? You can't please man. They are fickled. Think about this whole thing we're going through. This, this uh, 
edict and 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 that order and this executive this and everything's changing and we'll do this and we'll do that. God's not like that, right? What might please man today may not please man tomorrow. Anybody who's been married can understand how that works on both sides. But God's there to justify us. He's there to, to make things right and he's going to bring us peace in our lives. And uh, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Christ never changed, so the righteousness that he imputes to us never changes. Verse 34. Christ makes intercession for us. Who is he who condemns it? Is it Christ who died furthermore, also risen? Who is even at the right hand of the Father, also makes intercession for us? Think about that. Is Christ going to condemn us? No. Satan can't condemn us. Man can't condemn us. There's no condemnation. Christ is not going to condemn us because he paid the price for us. He's rooting for us. He's there at the finish line saying, hey, come on, run a little bit further. The marathon's almost over. And look how he, uh, God buffers us, right? Verse 34 says that Christ makes intercession for us. Why is that? Because he's at the right hand of the Father. Right there at the seat of the power, right? Right there. Christ is right in his Father here making intercession for us, filling in the gap for us. But not only is the Son there making intercession for us in verse 34, but also in verse 37 and verse 27, the Spirit makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. So again, all that groaning and all that thing that comes together as Christ sets there, it's a, it's a dual intercession that, that keeps the, the believer secure in Christ, right? Can I lose my, my salvation? I don't think you can. I think if you've really been saved, I don't think you can. I, I, just, I just don't. You got the Father who has sent the Son, the Son who has died, the Spirit who, who fills you, the faith that sustains you. I, I just don't think you can if you're, you're really saved. Now you can stumble, you can fall, you can look bad, you can, you, can, you can make a mess out of everything. There's no doubt about that. Though you're not under any obligation because the Spirit of God fills you so that you don't have to sin. You can overcome sin and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but you can. Uh, sometimes I successfully do it. Sometimes I don't. But the longer I live, the more I follow Christ, the better off at it I am than I used to be. Again, conforming to the image of His Son. So how is that? How does that work? I, I, Jesus, Jesus will always say it better than I do. And, and if you've been around me at any time, you know this is like my one of my favorite verses of Scripture. When I turn over to John. Chapter 10, and I began to look at verse 28. Well, let's look at verse 27. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's what they do. They hear Christ. How do they hear Christ? From his word. God left this for a reason. It's not something set on shelf to, to gather dust. This Bible has a, a meaning and a place in life. And, and Christ calls his sheep, and his sheep hear him speaking, and they follow after him. How do they do that? Well, they adjust their life. Whatever they were doing, they put that aside to do whatever Christ has called them to do. They follow him. And watch this. He says, I shall give them eternal life. Who's going to give them eternal life? Christ. How is he going to be able to do that? He purchased that to us. He's the prince of life. He's the resurrection and the life promise to give that to them and they shall never perish right can't lose something that you can't lose right you heard those people say I'd lose my head if it wasn't attached well it is attached unless something terrible goes on it's not going to happen nothing terrible enough is going to go on to make you separate from Christ Satan so have to get up early in the morning and eat a whole bowl full of Wheaties and he still can't compare or what's going to happen here in this next little bit. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand, right? My Father, who gave them to me, right? We're, we're God, God's gifted us. God's gifted us to His Son. His Son has purchased us. You can see how it's all layered up. The Son says, you can't snatch them out of my hand. And He says, my Father, who gave them to me, who intended me to have them, right? 
is greater than all. Well, greater than what all? All all. What all? Everything all. All of creation would have raised its fist up against God. He still sat in heaven and laugh at it because it could not thwart his plan or turn his attention away from what he wanted to do. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, right? Christ, Christ, us, the Father, nothing can snatch them out of the hand. Spirit of God indwelling us so that we don't want to get out of the hand. Nothing can rip these hands apart. I like verse 30 says, I and the Father are one, right? One what? One in principle, one in ideas, one in thoughts, one in passion, one in desire to hold on to the sheep. So Christ intercedes for us. So what does that really mean? Verse 35 through 39 says Christ loves us. Christ, God is, is for us. Christ has died for us. God has sanctified us. Christ in the, makes intercession for us. Verse 35 says, who shall, separate, who, shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Paul begins to ramble off a list. Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sore. Paul's racking his brains here. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing can separate us from the love of God of Christ. Now, look at all this stuff. It doesn't say he's going to keep us from it, right? He's not going to keep us from, from trials. He's not going to keep us from distress. He's not going to keep us from persecution. He's not going to keep us necessarily from famine. Not necessarily going to keep us from from, from nakedness or peril or the sword. Certainly didn't keep Paul from any of these things. Paul was right in the thick of God's will and, and a lot of what he did, and yet he still was was beaten and, and cast aside and, and put in prison and shipwrecked and and all those things. He spent a day and a night in the deep. He, he's there. These things are, are, are made to make us grow. I don't want to grow like that. I don't. I, I don't want to either, but I'm telling you, some of us hard-headed. Some of us don't get it. Some of us won't wake up. Some of us, as soon as they uh, green light us going again, we'll forget all the promises that we made whenever we, we said that uh, when this COVID-19 thing is over with, we'd do better, right? Some of us said, you know what? One of the things I'm going to do when we're able, I'm going to go to church. It's going to happen. You know what? I'm going to go on vacation this week. We're going to forget it. So something else may have to come. God's going to conform us to the image of his son. Now, now, oftentimes, if you've ever been conformed to something, if you've ever put anything in a mold or you tried to mold something. When I was young, um, my mother used to make these molds. It was plastic comparisons. She would put those quail. Um, she would put the plaster into these quail molds, and she'd paint them, and she had uh, plaster things with, with prayer hands, and she would paint those and and you know she conformed it it had to be packed in there god's going to pack you in and yet during all of this thing doesn't mean god doesn't love you the world would like for you to know that some of the preachers on television like you know that, hey god don't like it because you, you you not got all this money god don't like because you don't have this big house god don't like it because you can't buy this jet airplane god don't like it because you're not healthy god don't like it because you got cancer no, 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 that's true. Christ loves you through every bit of that, right? If, if, if God had to watch his son on the cross die for us, I promise you he never stopped loving his son on that cross. If Jesus had to go out into the storms of those seas, it seemed like every time they got on a boat to go across the Sea of Galilee, there was a storm coming up or, or fixing to come up or come up, you know. I just stopped traveling by boat, but in the middle of all of you, we found Christ. I'd been one of the disciples. He said, you know what? I think I'll walk around here this time. Meet y'all on the other side. That boat thing, you know, oh, you be getting that, there's going to be trouble, right? Christ said, come on, I'm going to get in the boat with you. We're going to crawl across. There's going to be something that happens. It's going to be significant in your life. It's going to show you who I am in the middle of it. 
All these things are designed to show you who God is, who's God in your life. Is He your provision, your provider, uh, your, your, your healer, your, your comforter? Who is all these things? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? None of these things mean that Christ doesn't love you. Verse 36, For your sake we are killed all day long and we are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Put a little bit of Old Testament, Psalm 42, 22 in there. Does that mean that, that, that God doesn't love us even though we're slaughtered like lamb? No, I don't want to be. But it doesn't mean Christ doesn't love me. Verse 37 says, Yet in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. Right? In the middle of the tribulation, the distress, the persecution, the slaughter, the nakedness, the peril, the sword, all of this killing going on in the very middle of that, God says we're more than conquerors, super conquerors, over and above. Why? Because God's already conquered and we're sitting back and watching him continue to work his conquering ability. How is that? Through him who loved us. These things come up and we overcome it. And if we don't make it out physically, the Bible says that God has justified us and he's waiting one day to glorify us. So if we, some of this gets us. It's, it's a pretty big chance that you won't make it off this world alive. So if some of this gets us, it doesn't mean Christ doesn't love us. The absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And we already have God's promise that we know that all things, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Again, what is his purpose, right? To be conformed to the image of his son. Paul waxes eloquent here in verse 34, 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Paul lists all these things, and he says, uh, best he can tell, none of these things will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how firm it is. God's always going to be on your side. His Son has paid the price. You are one of His children. God not going to to waste the blood of his son and miss you. That's how precious the treasure of heaven is. And God bestows that on us through faith in his son. And with that faith comes his love. The love of our father, or our father, that spirit of adoption has come on us. And we're not children who have been aborted now, right? We're not children without purpose. We're people who have been made to be mature so we can handle the things that are gifted in the kingdom. The, the things that are gifted out in eternity, right? When we get to heaven, I, I can't imagine it just being one day after the other as far as eternity is concerned us sitting there playing on our harps and, and watching the clouds pass by. There's uh, God's a God, dynamic God. And he'll have his, his children doing dynamic things there in heaven. And we'll get to witness a, a lot of things. We'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll, we'll see the judging of nations. We'll have a lot of things going on. Some of us will have to go to some remedial school because we didn't get it right. And Jesus uh, set us at his feet as a perfect teacher. And he'll begin to teach us throughout all eternity all those secret things about him that we don't know. And even some things we didn't get about how... He was able to make that thing and this thing work out for our good. Well, God, I don't think that worked out for my good. Oh, let me peel back the layers and let me show you how this worked out for you. If you didn't if you didn't get in that right there, you wouldn't have been over here, right here. And if you hadn't been here, you wouldn't have found me. The treasure of heaven has been spent for you. And there's no condemnation. There's no, no obligation. And ultimately there'll be no frustration. 
Jesus' name. Dear Father, I pray your spirit and your word line up and we have an understanding of this verse of Scripture. In Jesus' name I pray.